Hello, and welcome to episode 15 of the Brownie Knits podcast. I'm your host, Gina, aka Brownie Knits. You can find me on Ravelry and Instagram as Brownie Knits, all one word. I'm also on Facebook and Craftsy. Welcome to all of my returning viewers and to all new viewers. Thanks for watching this video. If you watched episode 14, you know that I teased a lot of information that was coming in episode 15. So here we are today and we get to talk about all that stuff. Um, this is also the episode where I'm going to talk about block five, which is our May block for the Brownie Knits 2015 block blanket along, which is um, you can hashtag BK blanket along on Instagram and Ravelry to share our photos. If you are new to the group and want to join our blanket along, you can get all of the free block patterns up until this point on Ravelry and on brownieknits.com. It's never too late to join in. It's a year long uh, blanket along. We do a block a month, so. Um, all right, so I'm gonna cover the block first so that if you want to grab that pattern and cast on and work on that block a little bit while you're watching the video, you can. And then we're gonna go into some of the exciting news that I have to announce and catch up a little bit on what's been going on the last few weeks and some projects and stuff. So, and then we'll, we'll wrap up with answering some questions from the Ask the Podcaster thread from the Browning Knits Ravelry group board. So, all right, so here it is, block five. And yay, here you go, you can see it first. I'll let you guys see it first and then I'll talk a little bit about it. It is our first cable block. So, here it is in red. This is out of a custom, I dyed this myself using um, a Miss Babs yarn base and I dyed it this lovely red color. And this one is out of Barocco Vintage in the mushroom colorway. All right, so like this is going to be our first block in the blanket that uses cable, cables. So if you haven't done cables before, don't be scared, um, I'll talk a little bit about that now but you can also watch a techniques video that I uploaded last month that has demonstrations for the butterfly stitch in it and then at the very end I show how simple it is to do a cable so after you work this cable block you will be a master at cables so the way this block works you cast on your 52 stitches down here at the bottom and you do your garter bottom edge on the last row in the instructions, I tell you um, where and how to decrease, or I'm sorry, increase. For this block, we increase a ton of stitches. When you're cabling, um, your cables draw your work in. They also draw your work down a bit um, in this instance because of how compressed everything is in this block. Um, so when you're designing, <clears throat> and you're using cables, if you wanna get the same distance across, I wanted to get 12 inches across like I did the other blocks, we had to increase the stitch count a lot. So I, I usually do one stitch per four to five um, stitches that are in a cable or one stitch um, per cable twist. Um, so you increase quite a bit and then you're going to have these edges or knit just like always so you have your garter edge and then the center panel is a multiple row repeat and you're going to have rows where you're just going to be doing a combination of knitting and purling and then you're going to have rows where you do a cable twist and in this particular cable I thought you guys were up to the challenge on the cable rows you're pretty much cabling all of the stitches across in a row but that's necessary to get this lovely X's and O's theme for the block. Um, this block is our May block. And when I sat down to design for May, um, I thought about what the month means to me. Growing up, my birthday is in May and my mom's birthday was the same week as mine. Um, and then you have 
a couple holidays in there for the U.S., the, um, Mother's Day and Memorial Day. And in my family, when I was very young, we always got together on Memorial Day and had like a little cookout. It was always like the first cookout of um, the summer for us. And May also was the year that, or the month when school would let out for me growing up. And it was always full of like graduation parties and things like that. And I live in Indiana, so we have the Indianapolis 500. And even though I'm not into that, there's always a lot of hubbub in the um, state just kind of feels energized um, during the month of May. And where I grew up is actually only an hour, 15 minutes maybe, north of um, Louisville. So the Kentucky Derby was always a big thing too. Like we, my mom loved to watch that on TV um, every year. And so we'd have, if it, you know, we would have like a cookout for that too and stuff like that. So May was always just like a fun time for me growing up. Um, and I'm hoping that it stays that way. Um, last year in May, I lost my mom. And so I'm dealing with the anniversary of that this year. And I don't want to celebrate that. I want to celebrate her birthday and my birthday and all the happiness that we've always had in May. So this is called the, actually is it, it's either with love or my love square. So I went with like an X's and O's theme. I've always liked this kind of cable combination. I worked out the stitch count for our block. And this is another one where I would suggest putting it probably in a center, or at least even if you don't have something below it or above it, have something on three sides of it to help you pull it out. So when you're knitting it, this one's gonna be really crunched up. And then when you block it, you really will block it out to size. And then when you sew it into your blanket, you'll if you surround it by at least three sides, it'll help pull that out too. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about cable needles. Um, you can cable without a cable needle, and if you search on YouTube, there are plenty of videos showing you how to do that. Um, if you're a new knitter and you're new to cabling, I would suggest using a cable ne needle. It'll just make you feel a little more secure. Um, my favorite cable needles, I believe this one's from Lantern Moon, and you can see it has that dip in the center, and that just helps to hold your, your stitches while you're um, knitting other stitches from your needle for your cable. So um, I found those to be really helpful to have the little dip in the middle. And then these are bamboo ones and they come in like a little set in three different sizes. And they also have a dip in the middle. These are from Clover, I believe. I believe that's right. And I believe the rosewood ones are from Lantern Moon. Um, and you want to choose the one that is closest in size to the needle that you're using for your project. For cables, they're, they look scary, but they're not. Let's say you have um, a six stitch cable and your, your stitches are in this order on your needle. All you're doing when you cable is you're crossing those six stitches so that they become in a new order. So now their new order is this. You've moved these three, move over here, and these, sorry, these three move over here, and these three move over here. So sometimes you will be told, put this many stitches on your cable needle and hold it in front of your work. Sometimes you'll hold it in back of your work, and then you'll do some stitches from your needle and then you'll do knit, knit or purl, whatever you're told, the stitches from your cable needle. I personally like to put my stitches from my cable needle back onto my needle before I knit or purl them. I just think it's easier. But if you're someone who can do it straight from your cable needle, great, it saves you steps. The other thing I wanted to mention about cabling, um, especially with this block, since when you do a cable row on this block, you cable all the way across the row, you might consider using a lifeline. A lot of people use lifelines for lace work, but you can really use them for anything. And it just makes it a lot easier if you make a mistake and you have to rip out your work. You can literally take the work off your needles 
and rip it down to your lifeline and then slide your needle through your lifeline row and all your stitches are now back on your needle and takes a lot less time to correct um, a mistake. So what I would recommend is um, that you pick a row that you wanna put your lifeline on, take a tapestry needle with a long piece of thread or dental floss, something like that, and after you work your specific row that you've selected, you will thread your tapestry needle and thread through all of the live stitches on your needle. Do not thread it through your stitch markers. You wanna be able to use your stitch markers going up, and if you thread it through, they'll get locked in that row. So you thread it through all your live stitches and then leave that thread or dental floss just hanging there and it will hold all your stitches in that row and then if you need to rip out it's easy peasy. Um, I do suggest that you pick, pick a certain row and always put your thread, your lifeline thread on that row because if you have to rip out then you know what row you are now on again. So you can just move it up to the new um, you know, whatever row you select. If row five is your row that you're always gonna put it in, then once you've gotten row five knit again, thread it through and go on up. Let's see, is there anything else I wanna say about this one? Just go slow. If you're new to cables or you're scared of cables, just go slow, use your lifeline, read the instructions carefully, and you'll be fine. So I can't wait to see everybody's blocks when they're done. Again, this is one that you want to block the heck out of when you are done knitting it. Okay, so that's everything for the block blanket. All right. All right, so the exciting announcements that I have. So I was sitting one day and knitting away and I received an email from an editor at Knitsy Magazine, and Knitsy is an interactive online magazine. Um, it's out of the UK, but they do have a US office. Um, and she said, you know, I saw your website, I really like your design work, and we'd like to feature you in an upcoming issue of Knitsy. And I was so excited <laughs> and really flattered, and then, then after I said yes, I was kind of terrified. So being completely honest. So, but um, we went back and forth with the interview questions and then the issue just came out and it's their May issue. It's issue tw number 20. And you can, it's a digital magazine, so it's not a hard copy magazine, but you can go and get their Nitsi app. I believe they have it for, well, I know they definitely have it on iTunes and I believe they have it for Android as well. And you can get it on your desktop or on a tablet, um, phone, whatever. So the article, um, the Knitting Together article is their feature on me. And I'm, like I said, I was extremely flattered. I just think they do a really nice job with their layout and stu such too. And they're an interactive magazine. They have, um, for example, like if you, click on different things, it'll go, like this one flicks and has my bio. Um, you can click on the images and they'll pop up and be larger. They also have embedded um, videos and things like that. So if you download, you they're, it's free to download the app. And then you just, you can either subscribe um, for a fee or you can buy each issue individually. So I would encourage all of you to go up and check out an issue. They have really cute patterns. They from what I can tell from the designer bios, they um, have patterns from designers all over the world. So I was really happy to um, be featured in their magazine. And a couple of the questions that they asked me um, then reveal some other exciting things that I have going on. So I thought I'd share those with you guys today. One of them, one of the questions was, have I, um, have I had or am I planning any kind of collaboration. And I'm super excited to let you guys know that Christina Wall of A Knitter's Life and I are working on a design collaboration that will be released later this year. So 
it will be a design from me and a design from Christina. They'll be coordinated to go together and they will come out at the same time and we probably will have a crossover podcast episode where it goes up on both of our YouTube channels and we'll have some knit alongs and some giveaways and things like that. Um, they will be for purchase patterns, but we tend to keep our prices really pretty low because um, we want everybody to be able to knit from the patterns. Um, so that was one thing. I'm really super excited about that and um, having so much fun um, putting together a design with one of my closest friends. It's just really a lot of fun. Um, so that's one exciting thing that um, is revealed in the article. The other thing is as I've been going through like family photos and papers, um, if you've ever had to go through like somebody's um, things after they've passed, like you find all kinds of stuff that you had, didn't know existed. So I've been slowly this past year going through things like that and I found, I've learned a little bit more about some of my ancestors, but, I, but I've also just um, was taken with my grandmother and her sisters and my great-grandmother and her um, sister-in-law. And so I decided that I'm gonna do an ebook of hat patterns that are all named after my ancestors. And if you've looked at my hat patterns before, a lot of them have kind of a 1920s feel and I tend to like to kind of design those shapes in hats. So I think a lot of them will probably have that kind of feel to them. Um, but I'm not promising. It's all open at this point. I don't have anything on paper or on the needles or hooks. So, um, but that will be releasing later this year, or early next year. So I'll probably release it as an ebook for a set price and then individual um, patterns from that will also be available for, you know, an individual price. So those are some exciting things that have been happening in my life. Um, and it's so nice that I had those things happen when I am coming off that oral surgery. So the last time I podcasted, I told you guys that I was going in the next day for an oral surgery to have a couple wisdom tooth teeth removed. And I went in and it was fine. Like I don't really remember much from that day in general. That night I thought, oh, this is not bad at all. Piece of cake. I even had like all these ideas that I emailed Christina about the next day, like came up with names for our patterns and all this stuff overnight because my mind was just going and going and I felt fine. And then all the numbness wore off. <laughs> and um, honestly, until like a couple days ago, it was pretty painful. So I just now am getting back to the point where I can eat a little more normally, although I'm still selecting a lot of softish foods and um, later day later in the day is harder than in the morning and that kind of thing so they're healing it's just taking a little while so but I made it through and I didn't chicken out so yay um, so that's kind of what's been going on in my world so I hope you guys are excited and will um, join in our collaboration knit along project later this year and then we'll enjoy the hat book as well so and do check out Knitsy. it's a great magazine full of um, really diverse patterns so all right what else did I have so I'm just going to show you a few finished items so I mentioned before when I am not feeling well I tend to crochet more than I knit and I I just I was thinking a lot about that while I was healing from my surgery and I think that a lot of the crochet projects I pick it's like you know four stitches you know count to four and then you do something different and you count to four and you do something different or three or whatever so I think when you're not feeling well that's that's an easier thing to think about than I'm gonna cable this and yarn over here and all that stuff so but I worked pretty much exclusively on my scrap can blanket and I finished it so here it is it turned out so great and I used the Sped and Chloe fine as the blue teal colorway that is connecting it all I want you guys to get to see 
as many of the blocks as possible. It's so colorful and it just turned out really cute. I'm really happy with it. For the edging, I kind of just made something up. I only had so much left over of the Spud and Chloe. Um, I was down to my last gain, so I did something very simple. I went in and I would do a little shell in the line where it connected and then do simple um, single crochet and a chain to get across this this part of the block and then in the corners I did a bigger shell and then the single crochet and chain to the next join and did that all the way around and I kind of selected that because if you look where in the center where your four blocks connect it kind of creates this little round motif like a little medallion right there and I thought that the shells kind of mirrored half of that so I thought that was kind of cute and that's why I went with that as my pattern for the edge. I haven't blocked it yet or anything. I'll probably just throw it in the wash and then um, block it out so that the sides lay a little bit flatter. But the entire time I was working on it and then once it was finished, I had to fight Kennedy for it. Like she would be, she'd get, you know, scratch out and get it all into a little ball and curl up on it. And then I'd be like pulling on this little portion of it so I could continue crocheting on it. So. Um, like all blankets in my house, and he, she thinks everything is fair game in hers. So um, that was, but that was a fun project, and I'm happy to um, have done it. And it was a lot of fun. I still have a lot of yarn left, sock yarn leftovers, um, bits here and there. So I have to figure out what to do with the rest of those. Um, and then I yesterday, which was already May. I finished up my April socks. So I was a little bit behind on those because I hadn't been knitting for several weeks. My husband said that he knew I was starting to feel better when I, when I picked up my knitting again. So these are um, Regia Floromania in the neon beach colorway. And I didn't worry about matching them up. I just started wherever it was in the yarn ball. I did 64 stitches, I think I did 12 rows for the ribbing, two by two rib. Came down, did a fishless lips kiss heel. And then came down here and did, um, I like to do a knit one SSK, knit across, knit two together, knit one, and then do the same. That's how I do my toes. Do it like a double decrease with two stitches between. So they haven't been blocked yet, but um, I wanted to show those. I thought they turned out really cute. So I have to pick out what yarn I'm gonna use for May to do my May socks. So those were my knit and crochet finished projects. And then I have a sewing project that I finished. Um, Carol, if you are watching this video, um, you need to look away for the next little bit and I'll tell you when you can look back. Um, not only is my birthday in, in May and my mom's, but also my good friend Carol's. So they're really all within one week. So I did this for her. And I love the colors that are in this. Thought it was so adorable. Even got a little crafty and did a little thing there. I don't want to like say too much in case she's listening. Um, and then the inside did as a contrast. And little thing there. And then there's some things in there. So that will go off in the nail today so that it can get to her in time for her birthday. All right, Carol, you can look back now. All right, um, let's see what else. Oh, I also made something for you guys. So for the Ask the Podcaster thread, if you ask a question in that thread, I'm answering two to three an episode. And so 
uh, we're getting such great participation that I'll probably be answering questions from that thread the rest of the year, <laughs> which is fantastic. I really like that. Um, but that also registers you for our May podcast giveaway. So if you're a member of the group and you ask a question and they ask the podcaster thread, it registers you for the drawing that will be in the next podcast. It will be in episode 16. And you're going to get a pattern, a free pattern from, um, a gifted pattern, I should say, from Christina Wall of A Knitter's Life. It's her Adrift Shawlette, which is a really pretty pattern. You can look at it in Ravelry. And um, then because it has like a summer water marina type theme to it, I put together this bag for you. And it uses this little rope fabric and I added on a little zipper pull that's a little anchor. And then I popped in a couple skeins of yarn. Now, I'm not totally sure that you'd have enough of this to do the adrift pattern, but I think you could probably squeeze it out of these two. So this blue is Madeline Tosh Volga Iyer Light. And then the cream is a Richard Deveries I think I'm saying that correctly in like this a uh, cream color way. So they're both sock yeah sock weight yarn so you would get those two skeins of yarn this little bag and the pattern from Christina now I'm just new to sewing so there are issues with the bag but that's okay there's a little puckering here but it still functions and it's still really cute just don't look at the bottom so <laughs> And with this one, I did a fleece um, interfacing, so it's more padded than the other ones that I had done previously, and I really like that. So anyway, so that is another thing that I made and um, the information about the giveaway so that you have that for in case you haven't entered yet. Um, what else? Let me look at my notes and see if there was anything else that I wanted to talk about. Oh, we had two... I had two other things, three if you break them down, I guess. Okay, so the first thing is, um, there was a question that came up on one of the Ravelry, on, on the Ravelry board in one of the threads about how you put yarn into a hank. So, if you're, I mean, we all know a yarn ball, you know, you're gonna have a little, sometimes yarn is sold in a ball and sometimes it's sold in a hank. And the question was, how do you get it to look like that? So, um, first of all, your yarn, and this one has a label like kind of tied there, but your yarn is threaded around um, in a circle, usually on like a swift or something like that. And then it's tied off, so you'll have your little ties. You've all seen that when you get a new ball or a new skein of yarn. But what happens if it, you do this so that you can see it, how do you get it back to being all pretty again? So you take it and you twist it. So you twist, twist, twist. So I've got my hands kind of in between. Twist, twist, twist. As much as you want and then this is the tricky part you want to without you losing that tightness you need to get halved so I always use my elbow and pull down and then you slip one through the other and then you've got it twisted up again so that's how you do that you wouldn't want to do that for your yarn while you're using your yarn. Like if you have an active project, you don't want to store your yarn that way because it's just a mess to knit from that. Um, so you want to you know, get it into a ball before you knit with it. But I use this technique when I'm storing my, I have a lot of like fabric infinity scarves and things like that. And I, that's how I store my infinity scarves. Now this one is connected but some of my regular scarves that have ends, I'll just like tie them together to make a loop. And then you can just do the same thing again. You can just twist it. I like to twist with my right hand because it's my dominant hand. And then 
I do something like that and then pull it through and you've got like this nice twist and then I just stick them down in a basket so I have them all lined up so there you go Kim I think that I think you might have asked that question so there you go that's how you make the the twist all right and then we have some questions from the ask the podcaster thread so the first question and it's actually a set of questions so I'm going to take them um, probably in chunks and this is from to Nandy who is Heather from Arizona she asks what fiber related events do you attend are there any events you haven't attended that you want to and what are some experiences at the events good and bad so what have I attended there are a couple local events that I like to go to just because they're easy to get to. I can just pop over for a couple hours and I don't have to like, you know, go out of state, pay a hotel fee and kennel the dog and all that stuff. So there's a Greencastle fiber event in Indiana that actually was the weekend when right after my surgery. So I didn't plan that very well. So I didn't get to go to that one this year. Um, I think it's just called Greencastle fiber event. And then there's one usually around the first week, weekend, second weekend of June called Hoosier Hills. And that's in Franklin, Indiana. And usually I'll drive over there um, and take a peek around for an hour. Both of them are fairly small festivals. They're not all that huge, but hey, it's a fiber festival and those are always fun. Um, so those are ones that I usually go to regularly. Um, last year in October, Christina and Carol and I went over to, I think it was in Yellow Springs, Ohio, to the wool gathering, and that was a really nice fiber event. Um, it was just, the whole day was really nice. It was, it's, you know, it's in the fall, so it's kind of crisp air, but it was a beautiful day. They had the pumpkin patch open with the hay rides and things like that, so you had a mixture of people attending the event plus people out with their kids, the pumpkins and stuff like that. So it was just a really festive atmosphere. The next town over was super cute. Um, and we went over there and hung out and had lunch and stuff. So it was just really a fun day. I've also gone to Stitches Midwest, which is um, in the Chicago area, usually in August or September. Um, and if you've ever been to a Stitches, you know how dangerous those market floors are because there's just anything you could ever imagine there. Um, for several years, I would go up and I would get there on Thursday when it opened and I'd stay in through Sunday afternoon. And my husband would go up too and he would take the train into Chicago and go to museums and things like that while I was at the event all day. And I took a lot of classes. The first year I took as many classes as you were allowed to, and it was too much. <laughs> um, by the end of it, I thought my brain was gonna explode. So I would say that is kind of, not necessarily a bad experience, but like a cautionary tale that if you are gonna go to an event where you have the opportunity to take classes, choose wisely and don't overdo it. You still wanna have fun, you still wanna be relaxed, you don't wanna feel like, um, you know, I was just like, I got to get my money's worth out of everything and I've got to make sure I can do all of it by the end of the class. And the classes are only two hours. They're meant to teach you something that you can then take and expand on. They're not meant for you to master it in the two hours. So I just had a little bit too much pressure that I put on myself. Um, the other kind of cautionary thing I would say about fiber events, and I've gotten a lot better about this over the years, you is so tempting to buy like just buy 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 and then I was finding that I would get home and you know five years later that thing I had to have I still haven't knitted um, so I am very cautious now on what I buy at a fiber event because you can just get so caught up in everything and um, so now I really go in either with a plan um, on what I want to buy or with a limitation on the amount or the number of projects I'm going to come away with. So 
this would be some cautionary things but in general I just have so much fun it's like you are surrounded by people who have so much in common with you and have such a common passion so they're really fantastic events to go to an event I've always wanted to go to and have it is Rhinebeck but I'm gonna go this year so I'm super super excited to do that in October um, my dad and his family and my grandmother all live in Pennsylvania so we try to make it out there at least once a year and this year I'm coordinating it so that we can spend some time during the week with them and then drive up to Rhinebeck and stay um, for Rhinebeck so I can go around and I'm not going to take any classes I don't think but hopefully I'll be able to meet some of you if any of you are attending I'd love to meet up with you and then do some shopping and just I've heard it called knitters prom so I'm so excited to see everything so that'll be a lot of fun um, let's see, do I answer all that? Oh, she asked what criteria I used in deciding which events are worth my time. Um, some of that, I mean, a lot of that goes based on proximity and then word of mouth and, you know, what I've heard other knitters and crocheters talk about. So, and then, um, she had a second set of, of questions. Are there designer groups that you belong to? Do you design when an idea comes to you or are you like a writer and have a set time that you set aside to work on designing? Does yarn give you the design idea or does the pattern you get, get you searching for the yarn? So, um, let's see, designer groups. I belong to TNNA, which is the National Needle Arts Association. Um, and, and I'm registered as a designer in their group. Um, and then I, you know, I am on some designer boards and Ravelry, that kind of thing. Um, but outside of that, not too much. I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Ooh, sorry, it is major allerg allergy season. And that was one of the things that made my recovery from my oral surgery so bad. We in Indiana, everybody where I live has dogwood trees. And... If you are not familiar with dogwood trees and when they first bloom, they have little flowers on them that are very, very fragrant. And then they drop those and then they have the, their leaves come out in full and they're green and they're pretty. They grow are really a fast growing trees, so they get planted in a lot of subdivisions around here. Um, but I am highly allergic <laughs> to the blooms, the flower blooms on them. And the week um, I was, the first week after my surgery all of the dogwoods were in bloom and I felt like my head was just gonna pop open and I also had a minor dry socket on the left side between those two things I was ready to just scratch my head off like so anyway thank goodness for Sudafed um let's see so I got off track there um do you design when an idea comes to you or do you do you do it like a writer um, the typical way that I design, I a lot of times will be knitting on something else or crocheting on something else, or I'll be listening to music and I'll have a design idea and I will jot that down in my, my trusty journal that I have here. So I'll design, I'll jot it down in my, my journal and then I will think about what weight of yarn or if there's a particular yarn that I want to use and then I'll search out the yarn. I don't often have the yarn bef before I have the design idea but um, a lot of times I might have a particular weight of yarn in, I in mind when I do a design. Um, every now and then the yarn dictates it like if I am trying to do something um, maybe to promote yarn in a shop or if, um, you know, I'm submitting to a yarn company for a design submission or something like that. But usually, usually not. For me, it's usually the other way around. I come up with the design and then search out what yarn I think would work up best in it. So that's kind of how I do those things. Um, and then the second question we have is from Ange in the East, who is Angela from East Hampton, New York, and she asks if I have ever crocheted or knitted a bag. 
And I used to do, when I taught classes at a local yarn shop here, I made a lot of bags and taught a lot of bags in classes. Um, it was just a really popular like second project for knitters um, because I taught a lot of beginning knitting and beginning crochet. It was kind of the natural second thing to do because you could do a felted bag. And I taught, what was that bag? Loose, the Lucy bag, which is a felted bucket bag. Um, I'll put the link to it in the show notes. But that's, you know, especially if you're a beginner or you haven't felt it before and you want to do a project, that's a great project to do. Um, Because, you know, as beginners, if you had a hole or whatever, you can felt that right away. Um, And so that was a very popular project. I also taught some techniques bags. um, And those, all my Lucy bags that I've made and all my techniques bags that I've made have all been gifted to people. I don't often carry my own crocheted or knitted bags. um, And... But there is one that I didn't gift away, that I did teach as a class, and that I kept. And that's this medallion bag. And this is a Noni bag pattern. And I used Cascade 220. And it is a Fair Isle bag that is felted. And it's a weekend bag. So you can fit tons of stuff in here. I didn't line mine because when I was teaching, um, I needed to show them how that looked on the inside, but I could line it now, I guess. And then I have like a hard bottom that I had my husband cut that I put in there, and then I put feet on it, and I have these nice leather handles on it. So I need to pull this out more in the fall and winter and use it. But it was a really fun project to do. There you can see the Fair Isle really well. And I, like I said, I taught this a lot and then um, just really enjoyed making that bag. So that's another one that I've done. All right, I think that's about it. It's a little wind, long-winded today, but we had a lot of content. So I hope that you enjoyed this podcast And don't forget to go up and um, ask a question so that you're entered for the giveaway. Um, The next giveaway will be announced, the giveaway will be announced in the next episode, episode 16. And I already have um, a little kit put together for our next podcast giveaway that will be announced. The winner would be announced in, let's see, July. And I'll tell you next time how to register for that one. So if you have any questions about the block, Um, pattern let me know don't forget that if you already have the patterns downloaded in your library in Ravelry when I put in a new file for a new block you have to blow out what was in your library before and re-add it so that you can see the file again Um, but as always they'll always be available for free download too on my brownieknits.com site Um, all the blocks will be free through Um, the end of January 2016, Um, so you want to download them before that time, unless you want to pay. It won't be a lot, just a little bit. All right, Um, I think that's everything. If you have any questions, let me know. Feel free to participate and chat away on any of the group threads in my Brownie Knits Ravelry board group, and um, I will talk to you later. Happy knitting, crocheting. Bye-bye.